Our next presenter is an FAA operations inspector. He's with the Orlando FISDO. He's a veteran flight instructor with over 22 years of experience in Florida. He has twice received the Orlando CFI of the Year Award. He is a former pilot examiner. He's administered hundreds of flight checks. He's a member of the FAA production studio right here in Lakeland. And he says that he's no longer a single pilot, he's a married pilot. Which probably leads us into his topic today, the single pilot and crew resource management. Let's welcome Mr. Steve Brady. Hello everybody, and welcome for coming to the beautiful Sun and Fun. I tell you, um, I don't know if you've been in our facilities before, but we'd like to thank everybody, all the operators. Uh, these are volunteers that come here almost seven days a week. And I would put this studio against any commercial entity, Channel 6, Channel 9, or whatever channel. We're very, very fortunate. And also we'd like to welcome all our internet viewers. We're live streaming on the internet. And we'd also like to welcome our Aviation Training Network satellite viewers also. So. Uh, again, I'd like to thank you for letting me speak. This is a topic that's very near and dear to the administrator, which is cockpit resource management for the single pilot. I know the flyer showed uh, single pilot IFR, which was a little bit of a mistake, but we are using um, CRM for the single pilots. As Walt said, I'm working for the Orlando FISDO, but prior to that, and nearer and dearer to my heart, was the years I spent as a flight instructor doing numerous freelance flight instructor activities as well as being uh, picked for several 141 schools to do assistant check instructor duties. Um, my children have literally grown up in this building and I got the best call in the world yesterday while I was upstairs working in the booth and my youngest daughter has called who graduates from college next week and she has called and wants to learn to fly so I get to do that very soon and they have literally grown up in this building as we as this building has evolved, so has she. Today's topic, CRM. I, I wasn't too aware of CRM when I came into the FAA. I'd, I'd always flown by myself or with somebody else that was not a pilot, so typically I would be in the right seat. And as I did the right seat stuff, you are an observer. You, you demonstrate, you explain it, you demonstrate it, and then you observe the student performing those duties and you don't stress enough cockpit, cockpit resource management. So I got into the FAA, automatically I was thrown into the two-pilot environment, and I'll be honest with you, it took me quite a bit of time to learn how to operate in that environment. So I put together this little presentation. It's not going to be as long as some of the former presenters. However, it touches on what this inspector's opinion is. I'd like to clarify that. This is not the FAA's opinion, um, although they concur with some of the things. These are my opinions on what I have seen over the 25 years of doing what I do. And again, thank you for letting me do this for you. I pose a question to people, is general aviation safer than air carrier transportation? Now over the previous five or six days, if you've been in here and you've seen some tremendous speakers, uh, John and Martha King, the, the couple that did the uh, glass cockpit aircraft. And we're going to talk about glass cockpit aircraft a little bit later on because it offers a tremendous amount of infor additional information for the pilot, which makes them have to adhere even closer to a, a resource environment in the cockpit. What do you, what do you guys think? Do you think single, that, that single pilot, general aviation, do you think it's safer than air carrier? What about you, sir? Do you think it is? I believe so. All right, we have, we have a hand that says it's safer. But the answer is, what do you think? Depends on the pilot. Depends on the pilot, okay. The answer is no. And in a moment, I'm going to put up a, the most recent statistic that I could pull off the National Transportation Safety Board. You, you know, Mr. Landsberg with AOPA and those guys, they spoke about the AOPA Foundation. And they keep track of those records too, but the most recent records that I could pull to get what I consider viable numbers is 
the 2006 NTSB reports? And the answer is no. And if you look at this one I highlighted in yellow, if you look at the air carrier, for scheduled air carrier, there was only two fatal accidents, okay? The 25 accidents total for almost 20 million hours of flying. Now, I've highlighted the one in yellow, and I want you to look at it. I'm going to bring it up a little bit because those numbers stand out, and these are the numbers that make our administrators scream. 1,603 general aviation accidents. 316 of those were fatal. 766 fatalities. Now, you'll notice the aboard says 605. That means that some innocent people on the ground were killed, and that is where the rubber meets the road with the FAA. Obviously, we would like zero fatalities. We would like zero accidents. That number is a work in progress. It's always going to be something that we aspire to achieve. However, is it ever going to happen? Probably not, but we can significantly reduce them. Last October, I was sent off to a school to uh, obtain a uh, turbojet type rating. And I'll be honest with you, uh, it was three weeks of the most horrific torture I've ever gone through. And um, fortunately, the FAA has been very good about training me in the use of CRM. But this particular check ride for the type rating was all about CRM. I had a first officer. And that person was significant in whether I pass and or have an unsatisfactory result. So about the third day of the class, the young man that had been assigned to me, I told him, I said, if you don't mind, I'd like you to arrive here an hour early every day, and I'd like you to stay an hour late with me every day because I'm 50 years old and I don't comprehend like you 24-year-olds. And his words were, Roger, dude, I'll be here. So you got to appreciate that youth. And in the end, he was very instrumental in, in my success. And I would like to feel that I was instrumental in his success. Back to those numbers. That's incredible, isn't it? Now, you saw some of the statistics the other day, if you were uh, fortunate enough to be in here for some of these great seminars, that you're, the most unsafe thing about general aviation is typically the drive to the airport. However, why is air carrier so much safer? So we pondered that, and I really started doing some studying on the situation, and we asked why. Why do you think that air carrier, and I know you, you're a former air carrier pilot, why is air carrier safer than GA? Why do the numbers indicate that? More training, he says. What do you think? More resources. More resources. Gentlemen that just arrived, what we're talking about is single pilot resources and why the air carriers have such a more significant safety factor. So, this gentleman said more training, I agree. And this gentleman said more resources. What I did here, I took a snapshot of a level D box, and there's no telling, but that level D box right there is probably in the excess of $20 million. And the type of training that can be, can be conducted in that type of uh, box is just incredible, okay? That box, can, they can do type ratings. There's a phenomenal amount of testing and checking that can be done. And then the advanced emergency training that can be done in that box, things you would never dream of doing in the airplane. And we'll talk about my experience in a little bit. That was just one of the things that piqued our interest on why single pilot is more dangerous. And of course, in that box, you rely heavily upon the person seated beside you. Either you're, when you're in the right seat, you depend on the person in the left seat. The left seat depends on the person in the right seat. So I got a little deeper into that. And as an inspector, I have the, the uh, I'm very fortunate in that I get to go around to a lot of uh, training centers, the CFR Part 142 training centers. And they employ a level of instructor that is commensurate with what I consider a higher power than the FAA, and that is the almighty insurance company. Insurance dictates how safe you need to be in your airplane, because if you're not, they'll price you out of the market and you'll never be able to fly. In the box, and by the way, that's the picture of the box, that, that was my torture chamber for about two weeks. 
In the box, you can practice multiple emergencies. You can shoot every approach down to absolute minimums, and you get a chance to evaluate and practice your crew resource opportunities. Now let's talk about low minimum approaches. As an instrument instructor, when I decided to get my instrument ready, I went around to the local FBOs, and I was very fortunate I belonged to an aero club. And I asked every instructor, will you teach me in the clouds? And it was astounding, most of them said no. But occasionally, one of our former uh, DPEs, he said, I will be more than happy to teach you in the clouds. And I said, well, that's good. I have more time than I have money. So if it takes a long time, I can save up for the training, but I would like to do it all in the clouds. And we started doing that. And I'll tell you, there's no difference between a, a hood or a view limiting device and being in the actual clouds. Also, it became very apparent to me when I became an instructor I wanted to teach my students in the clouds, and a lot of them, uh, I, I checked with other instructors, CFIIs who held the rating for instrument airplane that had never taught in the clouds, ever. They had always been what I call a hood pilot. And in, when I look back at on, on that, in reality, they should get a limitation, able to teach with view limiting device only, because it's a different world in the clouds. Things sound different, they feel different as we all learn to fight off those kinesthetic senses. And I later learned that for instrument approaches, most people were only teaching about 75% of an approach. In an instrument approach, there's typically four parts, the initial, the intermediate, the final, and then most importantly, the missed approach. If you're not having the thought process to plan that approach all the way to the mist with the option being to land, you have really shortcut yourself on a significant safety factor. Notice yesterday in some of the seminars they talked about uh, CFIT, control flight into terrain. When the aircraft breaks out from the instrument conditions and they're in a normal position to land, people still crash the airplane sometimes because they artificially destabilize the approach. Practicing in the box or in the clouds or when you go, I have observed as an inspector, I've actually got to observe instrument proficiency checks and once I got the instructor off to the side, I go, you really didn't give the guy or gal a fair shake because you never took them down to an actual DH. So if an approach is four parts, and you do an approach to an MDA, let's say, of 800 for a non-precision approach, and they go missed at 800, you, that qualifies for that approach. But if you're shooting an ILS, and the ILS terminates at 200 AGL, and, a, and the tower says 53125, terminate approach, please, and turn left heading 270, can you give them credit for that? Well, you can give them credit for the hood time, but not for the approach, because you've cheated that person out of the real training. In the box, we take every approach to minimums and we take them to the minimum RVR required. And I, as a DPE, I was very astounded at how many applicants never heard the word RVR. They had heard it, but they really didn't know what it meant. Now in the 135 air carrier world, excuse me, RVR is controlling, runway visual range for people that that don't know what RVR stands for. And it's a, it's, a, it's a range that the visibility is from the approach angle. And a half mile RVR is very disconcerting for the pilot. You might be right on the glide slope, needle centered. And if you're a single pilot, you're having to do two things. You're really having to fly the stabilized approach and be the eyes outside with a crew the captain's down, he's driving the bus, and the first officer is outside, and it's the best thing in the world to hear. Airport in sight, or airport lights in sight at 12 o'clock, Captain. All right? Roger, I'm down. Once, that, once those verbiage is, is, comes through your headset, number one, it's a little bit of a relief. Number two, it lets you go down to another 100 feet, which might get you in. Also, for the single pilot who's doing his own crew resource management, he or she needs to 
say to themselves, DH, the airport not in sight, I'm, I'm missing my approach. And that missed needs to be committed to memory. In a crew resource environment, you have that guy calling it, and it's real easy because we always have an agreement. Don't let me do anything stupid, Bill. Roger, Steve, I won't let you do anything stupid. You don't let me do anything likewise. And that's a very good thing. And that's why airlines are safe. Again, they're safe for several reasons. They can practice a plethora of emergencies, and they can practice their crew resource. I do a lot of enrouting as an inspector. Enrouting is where we get in the cockpit of the airplane and travel from point A to point B with them. Most recently, I went from Kissim excuse me, Orlando to Dallas and got to watch the crew resource in action, and I just take notes. And at the end of the flight, we can talk about it with the crew. And I always learn something, and typically they do too. And I think everybody in aviation is a student of the game. Some of the other reasons I put in here was that commercial operators, they typically fly every day or, or thereabouts. General aviation, again, especially with these new times with the fuel price being out of the, out of the ceiling, more people out of work, uh, hopefully we'll never have an aviation uh, landing fees and stuff, again, my opinion, because I think it would be probably one of the last stakes in the heart of general aviation. But general aviation is typically more recreational, and we probably don't train as intense as we should. And I get to sit in on flight reviews occasionally so that I can fulfill some 61 requirements in my surveillance as an inspector. But even as a uh, as a former pilot examiner and instructor that instructed in the local area, I didn't see the level that I see now. In fact, I was probably guilty myself of, I know John, I've known him for years, we're going to go do the $100 hamburger. The WINGS program was put into place to kind of thwart that a little bit. So by asking that question, how often do you fly, or more importantly, how often do you train, we open up kind of the inner sanctum and say, it's a, it's a self-gauging question. When you do the flight review, and as I started getting better at doing them, sometimes I might take two and three lessons to get the flight review. See, the, you're dictated by a practical test when you do a check ride that it's either satisfactory or unsatisfactory. But on a flight review, you simply refrain from endorsing, and it's hard to tell your friends, say, John, I've known you a long time, you fly pretty good, but you're really not too up to speed on your airspace, or you really couldn't tell me what a NOTAM is, and I'll be honest with you, I put NOTAMs in red because I travel the circuit with a group of inspectors occasionally. One of them is one of our retiring inspectors, Bill Hohenstein, and we do what's called the CFI Roadshow. And one of the gentlemen that accompany us is Steve Ruckman. He's, a, he's one of the guys at Orlando International, and Steve is a phenomenal speaker and he's very knowledge, knowledgeable about NOTAMs and stuff. And when he publishes a NOTAM up on the board, you almost have to have a law degree from, from uh, Berkeley to read it. And so AOPA, as, the, as well as the FAA, they publish on these sites now uh, easier ways to read NOTAMs. But invariably, you'll ask somebody about a NOTAM on a flight review and they won't know. And I tell you, I was asked about one I get used to the ones locally. I get used to the Disney NOTAM, the TFR for Disney. I get used to the one when the shuttle goes off. But here I was out in Dallas and had to read a Dallas NOTAM with the pressure of a check ride looming over my head. So, wow, I had, to get, I had to get busy with it. Graphic TFRs are pretty easy to see, but the published NOTAMs, like the FDC NOTAMs and stuff like that, they require a greater uh, uh, amount of awareness. C I ask, can you read a NOTAM? When's the last time you read one? When's the last time somebody gave you a NOTAM to read on a flight review? And these are all part of things that make CRM safer for general aviation because, yes, sir? Okay, I have a yeah, absolutely. Um, do you think we're going to get to a point where all, all the translation is going to be in this plain language? All right, what his question was, ladies and gentlemen, was, and for you people that are watching on the streaming video, is, is there ever going to be a point in time where the NOTAMs and all types of uh, publications are in 
plain English? And it's a great question. On a lot of the sites you go to right now, some of the commercial applications, WSI, DOOTS, and stuff like that, they have a link where you can click that says English uh, version. But no, Tams, I'm here to tell you, even in plain language, it is hard to read. You almost have to take a plotter. You almost have to take a measuring stick and, and plot, or take a sectional and plot the actual locations so that you can see the locations. And I urge you to go to FAA websites. There are what's called customer feedback. And, um, and also, I urge you to go to www.fasafety.gov because their eyes and ears watching that, and those are the types of verbiage and feedback that they need to go to Washington. I agree, it should be a lot simpler in a lot simpler format. Also, people that have a lot of these new modern avionics, they get very complacent in where they're at and where their little crosshairs show the aircraft to be. And it, in a case of a, in what we call a pilot deviation where you've had an incursion into airspace that you were not authorized to go to, well, I had a G-1000. I've heard it a hundred times. It doesn't, that dog doesn't hunt with the enforcement. However, if it was in plain language, it would make it a lot easier. And I highly encourage you to voice that on customer feedback. Part of the problem today I see is preparation. And a little bit later in the program, you're going to see where an inspector and I uh, he's a good friend of mine. He was a pilot examiner for years, and he's also one of our production people. We we did a we're, we did a reenactment, and you're going to see I'm really cutting up. But um, this is based on a true. I was at an airport down in South Florida, and I walked up on a guy getting ready to go for a flight, and I just asked him a couple questions. We were in a pair of jeans, looking looking very non-fed, and I just asked the guy a few questions, and he was blasting off on a trip. And you'll see the reenactment, it's kind of funny. But he wasn't prepared, and preparation is everything. See, at the airline level, i.e. The, the captain and his first officer, they arrive, the weather's already published for them, it's all printed out on a printout. The airplane's, with the exception of the pre-flight walk-around, the airplane's been maintenance released. They already know the passenger configuration, with the exception of the last few baby strollers or stuff like that. So a lot of their preparation work is done. Most recently, I got on an airline, and I was there an hour before they got there, and I just watched how they prepare simply so that I could be better prepared to talk to you guys today about this. First officer was running a little late. He jumped on board, grabbed a flashlight, and goes, I'm going to start the walk around. I go, Roger, I'll be right behind you, footstep for step. Now, I had already got on board and read the maintenance for the previous day's maintenance and the previous release for that aircraft from the flight it just landed. He never read it. Off we went, walking around the airplane, and I'd already read what they had done to it in the shop between the last flight and the last flight. So I never said anything, and we blasted off and we flew. Later, after the flight, I asked him, I said, is that your company procedure? And he goes, well, I'm going to be honest with you, I was a little bit late, and I said, I understand. And I said, but opening that book up and looking at some of the last stuff, that airplane could have been not returned to service. And then, and if it had been, I would not have flown, trust me, I would not have become part of that little deal. But anyway, he did, and he took the criticism very professionally, and, and we went about it. So that particular day, your tax dollars paid me for what I'm supposed to be doing, and that's to be looking out for you. But for general aviation, do we prepare enough? And my little video, which is a 100% reenactment of what happened, you will see that we don't. Do we assess the risk? Earlier, uh, you heard some, if you were here the last several days, you heard a lot of people talking about how they assess risk and what they do to risk management. And um, that's another area I think general aviation falls short. You saw the I'm safe, the illness, the medical, the stress and all that, the fatigue. However, there's a lot more things involved with it. Are we current? Now, just because we have a current flight review in our logbook, we might not have flown since those six months. One of the problems I see is you get a check ride. On check ride day, your nerves are up. You take the check ride. By God, hopefully I pass, you pass. And that's about the best we're going to see you for the next. Who, we don't get to see you again until another rating and or an instructor gets to see you. And it's a, 
it's a tough job for the instructor because we already talked about John giving his buddy Bill a check ride or a flight review. So a lot of times we don't assess the risk. The weather's going to be marginal. Are we going to be able to make it? So having said that, it's something we need to slow down and take a look at and look at the big picture. Our skills, and I'm going to tell you, I've been in the FAA now, I'm coming up on six years, and five and a half years ago, which was, I was brand new in the FAA, six months into it, I was a good pilot. I flew all the time, I instructed every day. In fact, um, it's hard to believe I am a married pilot versus a single pilot, because my other two wives didn't like that I flew all the time. I flew all the time, and I was a skilled pilot. Today, my skills are way below what they were back then, because I flew all the time. So part of my risk is, is I know that. I know what my skills are. The FAA has a program called 4040, and what we do is I, I'm, I am current right now in a single engine retractable. I'm current in a, a single uh, tailwheel. I'm current in a twin turbine, and I'm current in Learjet. But am I the best guy out there? No way. I aspire to be, but I know that my risk is a little bit higher than most because of the skill level. Inspectors don't fly as much as this, the everyday guy. Again, it's a self-evaluation. How are your skills? Does this remind you of anybody you know? Okay, again, so we've got the airlines that are training, dutifully training. They have recurrent training, requalification training if they need it. If they bust a ride, they have to redo that portion of that ride. Here, in the 61 world, it's not as stringent. So that probably accounts a little bit for some of the general aviation higher fatal. All right, you're going to see a little video that I did. And I am not kidding you that 15 minutes before we took that still shot that is going to turn into a video, there was not a cloud in the sky. Not one cloud existed in that sky. Of course, this is Florida. And as that humidity builds and the sun comes up and we get this uneven heating of the Earth's surface, wow. So here, let's see what we can get here. I'm not getting any mouse. Here we go. Stand by. I just did a panning shot. And again, another inspector and I put this together. It's a, and this will be a total reenactment of what I saw at this airport as I was bipping around in a pair of blue jeans, not even looking like an inspector. Within five minutes, the clouds were already turning into cues, and they with, with rapid vertical development. Now, the direction of flight is exactly right that direction. If you'll see underneath that cloud right there, that's the direction of flight. And it's from that point on where we did our little reenactment. And I think you'll find it funny. Volume on the computer, please. Hey, it looks like uh, you're getting ready to go now? Yes, sir. Uh, did you check the weather? No, there was no need to check the weather. No I'm, need I'm to check the weather. Times. Uh, but did you, look, did you look over there? It looked uh, like we have a lot of... That's uh, just the way the guy was loading his airplane. He was throwing the stuff in the Somehow. front. Yeah, you know, it's, it's summertime in Florida, so... It's every day like that. So. Every day in Florida is yeah. like that. There's a, I'll fly right up to it. If it doesn't look right, I'll just pick up the version or I'll go land. Hey. Did you hear what he said? He said, I'll fly right up to it. If I don't like it, I'll just go somewhere else. There's plenty of places to land in Florida. This is what the guy told me. I wrote it all down. We were coming back in our G car, and I said, I'm, we're scripting this because i got to play this for the people. This is why general aviation is not as safe as air carrier. Air carrier has a plan. This guy didn't have a plan. I mean, it's kind of funny. I couldn't believe it when it happened. Sound on the computer, please. It's up on the seat beside me. What, what the guy did was load well, his flight the, bag, the, the one that, that, that should keeps be better, his headsets in with the airport the facility directory, some sectionals, 
and he was Where questioned. Good, I questioned the guy. Don't know, you need that in the cockpit? And, uh, no, I got everything it? I need. I threw it on the seat. Now that's yeah, cockpit yeah. resource management. Um, uh, I, I've got what I need. See, I got all I need. I got all I need. And that's what the guy told me. He said, Roger, and your name is? And I looked at his license as medical while I was there. And, uh, and it was funny. I'm thinking, is this typical of general aviation? Because this doesn't occur in the airlines. And if it does, then hopefully inspectors are there to stop that. When you're flying single pilot and you are your crew resource management techniques, you are everything. You're the baggage handler. You're the loader. You're the pilot. You're the weatherman. And if there's people in the, in the airplane that are with you that are non-flying pilots that just are passengers, they are depending on you and they're placing their trust and their life and their loved ones in your hands. So you have a huge responsibility. I'll give you an example. About, about nine months ago, my youngest daughter, who graduates in a couple weeks, she wanted to go to Georgia, to a little runway that um, the audio guy Lee and I were talking about up in Georgia. And uh, it was going to be a night flight. They were going to get out of school that day about 4 p.m. down in West Palm. They were going to drive to Sanford where I keep this airplane. And I, it was funny because when you take your daughter, now you check the weather, you check everything. I had my plan, I had everything. I was going IFR. There were some storms moving in later that night. And of course, when they got there, I wanted them loaded and gone. I wanted to blast off and be gone so I could beat the weather. Or certainly, attempt the weather without them in the aircraft, which is a, what a, a, a dad does, especially one that has a lot of hours flying. The problem with a lot of hours is, is everybody feels that they are invincible with a lot of hours, and, and myself included. With a lot of hours, what ends up happening is, is you think, well, I've been there, done that, got that T-shirt. I know I've got a good plan. This airplane did have weather avoidance equipment in it, which is a wonderful tool to have. And so they arrive, and sure enough, here's her and four of her friends from school. But she didn't tell me they were the football team. My God, were they huge. And, I, and they all had these big duffel bags. So now I had to weigh everything, and we ended up putting a lot of the stuff in her trunk and leaving it. They were going on a little whitewater rafting trip up in Georgia, and I was going to drop them off, and then they were going to come back with some friends of theirs in a car. All right, so problem one of the chain of accidents was overloaded, I had to unload, and now we're blasting off late. So now I'm not sticking to my plan for, for crew resource management because now I'm the first officer, I'm, I'm the loading guy, I'm the pilot, and now I'm running late. So we blasted off and pretty uneventful. You know, airplane as we, you know, it, flies, it flew very well because it's nice and heavy, a lot of mass. But the airport wanted to give me an intersection takeoff. Okay, intersection takeoff, wonderful because I am running late anyway. That'll save a good 10 minutes. I took it. Step two, wrong, okay? I remember going down the runway, and I, the airplane was accelerating a little slower because it was hot. And down the runway we go. Airspeed's finally alive. You know, now you're going, if you have a crew, the guy goes, airspeed alive, Captain. Roger, I see airspeed alive. Rotate, Captain. It, well, now you're doing that all yourself. So now you're a little farther behind the aircraft. We got airborne and flew over the clearway, and I thought, wow, if we lost a motor at this point in time right here, I don't have any runway left. I compromised ourselves a little bit right there. Okay, but the hours that I have, all those hours made me safer, right? Wrong. The only hour that matters to a pilot is the next hour. You can have nine million hours in your logbook. It's the next hour that'll kill you because the ones in your logbook aren't going to hurt you. So we have to park that bag of ego and put it away because it's the next hour that'll hurt you. So what should I have done? You know, enlist the services of ground personnel. I should have talked to a pilot coming in. Hey, would you come in from the northwest, which is the direction I was going? What's the weather you see? Flight service station I had called earlier in the day from the FISDO. I called him from my desk and said, okay, I'd like to file IFR. That way that part of the portion had been done, but I didn't update it when I got there. See the mindset? That's what I'm talking about. Airline, when they show up, automatically have it on a printout waiting right there for them. Somebody does it for them. Another reason they're safer. 
I did check my internet provider. I checked it right up to the time I got in the car and drove up there. However, I didn't check the local pilot's knowledge. There was nobody around, and I was in a hurry, and I wasn't going to talk to him anyway. I was gone. I did talk to ATC. So th those are some of the resources that you can use. Nobody can tell you how to develop your own CRM methods. You need to develop your own. When I take my wife with me, she's not, she's not a flyer. My other wife was a flyer. I could hand her the duties. My wife, Michelle, however, likes to get there where we're going, go shopping, or get those little glasses with an umbrella in it, and we have a good time, okay? And I think that's a wonderful thing. But when that occurs, you have to put your mindset back into the CRM that you are the first officer and the captain, the baggage handler and everything. So everybody is placing their onus back on you. Checklist coordination. In a crew resource environment, you could even take a non-flying pilot and say, we're going to start right here at the pre-flight or the pre-lineup briefing, and I'd like you to take your finger and, and work your way down. And if you don't mind, you can either stow them on your side or hand them back to me, and I will stow them. And in a minute, you'll see a little video we did with the, with the other inspector on what we're kind of looking for. Instrumentation monitoring. You heard the other speakers in the last few days talk about these wonderful G1000, these glass cockpits. In the industry, you'll, you'll hear it talk about FITS training, you know, FAA and industry training standards that are set up for these glass cockpits. We call them TAA for, for um, technically advanced aircraft. Trust me, you fly one of those and get back in a steam gauge airplane, it takes a while to get the scan back. Your scan, the old six-pack scan where you look at the altimeter and you look at the airspeed, you go to the attitude indicator. As an inspector, what I do sometimes, I take a little laser pointer with me and I will point at the airspeed indicator and it'll be sometimes two, three minutes. And the guy will go, hey, look at that red dot on the airspeed indicator. I know it's been there three minutes. That tells me they have a glass scan and not a six-pack scan, okay? And we work on that. Instrumentation monitoring is ever important, especially in IMC. Single pilot, single engine, IFR by yourself at night is a taxing bit of information, input, 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 gathering, and that's why I put eyes and ears, because now everything needs to be open and everything needs to be working. You can't have stress. You can't have baggage from home. You can't have baggage from work. You've got to get from A to B safely. Again, it's not happening in general aviation, as indicated by our fatal accident rate. You know? Corporate aviation and, and air transportation in the air carrier world is enjoying one of its safest records ever. On the other hand, GA is not. And we, you and I, everybody here, the satellite viewing audience and the internet audience, everybody has to pitch in and help. This is my buddy. He's my assistant. Um, he was my mentor for years. He's a former pilot examiner also. And we put this together the other day. Audio on the computer, please, and here we go. Now, folks, we are in the cockpit. The key to single pilot operation or the successful single pilot operation is cockpit organization. Can you, him okay? you really need to take your time and think through exactly how you're going to lay everything in the cockpit so it's within easy reach of you and does not create any additional stress when you're flying. One of the first things that I do is I want to know where my normal checklist is, like this one. In this particular case, I have it in this pocket right here, easy accessible. In addition to the normal procedures checklist, I also want to have access to the emergency checklist, which I hope I never have to use. But if I do, I know exactly exactly where it's at. And I keep it handy right in this pocket. The next thing that I want to make sure that I have is, is a, a knee pad of any kind. Something is like a portable desk. It helps you to write things. Make sure you have plenty of paper and any pens or pencils. Maybe have at least two 
or three, because if you lose one pen or a pencil, you don't want to be searching around in the cockpit. You can just go ahead and grab another one. So that would be a, a good tip for you to do. Now, if you are flying IFR, which is when the stakes are really up, I strongly suggest that, that you have one of these flight organizers. You can have any, any kind. It doesn't necessarily which one. But at least it keeps you uh, organized. In this case, for instance, we have the departure airport, which is right here. The next thing will be our destination. In other words, it's just organized in that fashion. If we get to the destination and we can't do an approach, what do we do? We go to the alternate. And it's laid out right here for us. And you can have any other approaches that you may want to have here in the back. Something that you already planned and something that is easy for you to access. Now, where do I want this? Probably right here on the right seat. Easy accessible to me. Next, if I'm flying IFR, of course, I want to have my IFR uh, charts, which I don't want them like this. I want the chart to be folded exactly where my route is. I want to know at a glance exactly where I am and how do I get there. Where do I keep this? Again, I'm going to keep it right here in um, the, on the right seat. And last but not least is the VFR chart. Even if you're flying IFR, pay attention I to that. Even if you're IFR, a VFR chart. That you have a VFR chart with you. Because if the battery goes and your radios goes, the only thing you have if you can't tell, that will help from Cuba. you is the VFR. It's got all all the features, he has a Western accent. it tells you what the towers are. The IFR chart does not tell you those things. So this is probably the most valuable chart in our business, regardless of IFR weather or VFR weather. And going back to IFR, I, I want to point something out to you. If you have the means to set any kind of clamp or anything on your yoke or anywhere in the airplane that it will not be in your way where you will have access to see your approach plate, by all means, do it. And remember, once you get into the cockpit, single pilot, you are here by yourself. There is nobody else right here that could help you. We have a lot of help outside of the cockpit that we can use. And that is the concept of CRM. So one of the things, if you know that the cockpit has been taken care of, then suggesting ideas or help from the outside world becomes a lot easier. Okay. What he's talking about here is, is getting prepared. How many times have you ever been IFR and you reach down to get something and it falls below the seat? We all know that vertigo is greatly enhanced by the head down movement and raising the head rapidly. I've had it a hundred times. I highly suggest in these in a complex aircraft or an aircraft that has a wing level or autopilot, if you must go down to get a document and or a pencil or something, let the autopilot fly the airplane. We call it let George fly. And let George fly the plane until you get that piece of, of uh, information that you need with you. As I walk around airports, I love, you know, I'm nosy. I like to look at aircraft and I'll see wires hanging across the airplane. There'll be cigarette lighter wires, GPS is bolted on here and here and 
Folks, you're setting yourself up. You're setting yourselves up. You need some sort of organization in the cockpit. You would never see anything in the air carrier world like that. Now, having said that, Diego is very correct with that VFR chart. And you don't see that in the air carrier world. I always ask them, do you have the backup? And they do have it. It's down in the bag. But a lot of things you're going to hear about in the future is going to be talking about these glass cockpits. They, you'll hear the verbiage electronic flight bag. Okay, electronic flight bag means you have the airport diagram, you have the charts, and you have everything electronically available to you. Checklist for the airplane. However, the FAA still requires a paper backup. Okay, so I suggest having that and have it readily accessible. Certainly, if you're a single pilot. Okay, you don't have a first officer. You don't have the luxury of asking, "Hey, John, grab that for me." You see what I'm saying? So establish your own method. If you're solo in the cockpit, having your cockpit well organized and a plan of action takes one of the biggest uh, accident makers, in my opinion, away from you because you already have a plan. If you don't have a plan, remember that enactment I did earlier? That guy didn't have a plan. He was going to fly right up to it and said, if it didn't look good, he'd go somewhere else. That's a good plan, isn't it? And again, that's one of the reasons. And I see people looking at each other like, oh, I've done that. We've all done it but we want to talk about how to prevent, we want GA as safe as possible. If you have someone else up front, you can use them. Don't be afraid to say, hey, I've asked my wife, hey honey, will you read this for me? If I ask you, when we get ready to do the lineup, hold your finger right here on the lineup checklist for me, okay? She's more than happy to. In flying, you need to use if you have one, use the monitoring pilot. If you don't, you have to come up with your own methods. There's a little ditty we did. When we don't have a, another pilot sitting beside us, I apologize for this equipment. This computer up here is a little bit slower when we tested it. For the it was pilot, fine. Especially with respect to cockpit resource management. Some of the things we can do are little memory items. In a crew concept environment, if they tell you to climb and maintain 16,000, the first officer or the other pilot can set 16,000 to the pre-select. Hold his finger there, and then the pilot flying can say, I see 16,000. You don't have that luxury when you're a single pilot. So some of the things you can use in your cockpit are a secondary VOR. For example, if they said, Saratoga 5, 327 Mike, climb and maintain 6,000. You can reach over here on your, your number two VOR and set six as a personal reminder for 6,000. What we're talking about is using the secondary okay. VOR. If they say climb and maintain 6,000, you can dial so six in there for the memory device as well as on your keyboard. In a crew paper, resource environment, on, the pilot, the non flying pilot, would set it and hold his finger there until the captain the acknowledged it. Cockpit. These are just some of the things you can do. There's an advisory circular out put out by the FAA. One of the one of the one of our Achilles heels right now is these runway incursions. And you probably if you were fortunate to be here the other day and meet the FAA, you heard some of the people talking from the southern region. We have a huge number of pilot deviations and myself as an inspector, I I have the unfortunate task of doing a lot of these and doing a lot of the paperwork and they drive me nuts because it just shows an incredible poor planning on the pilots. This advisory circular, I suggest getting it. You can get them, Google it or you can go online to FAA.gov. It talks about the procedures, especially for taxiing an aircraft while single pilot. And, and a lot of it is the fact of taking out the airport diagram. You'll notice I put the cursor back when Diego was doing his thing, and again, I apologize for the equipment, but I put the cursor right on the airport diagram. We keep that on our knee board at all times, and we brief the taxi. In other words, we're here at point A. They told us to taxi taxiway Alpha, down to taxiway Bravo, cross 36 left, and hold short of Charlie. Somebody needs to take their finger and point out where they're going and plot it. And even if there's nobody else in the airplane, verbalize it to yourself. Because if you do that, then you have at least looked at it. 
And if there's ever any question, once you start, did they say right on Bravo or left on Bravo? Stop the aircraft and contact ground control. Get further clarification before you move on and have a moving violation of the FAA type, okay? So I highly suggest looking at that advisory circular. Okay, as you can see, if you utilize your resources, all we're talking about is reducing the risk, okay? And we can get those numbers down, and we can show Washington that GA can be safe because it's the kind of people that don't like GA that are going to take those numbers and say, it's unsafe anyway. Let's get rid of it. And if you love your freedom, this is the freest country in the world. Thank you then you need to be part of this program to help make everybody safer. So if I say stuff that you like, send it on to the next person. If I say stuff you don't like, ad lib and do your own. But bottom line, we need general aviation safer. How do we do that? Air carriers already demonstrating they are safe, safe as they've ever been. Let's adopt some of their procedures and practices. And they do it by using multi-crew. So sometimes you're both persons. As long as you know that, verbalize it. Bottom line is what we're trying to accomplish is we're trying to change general aviation's culture. How do we do that? By being more proactive. Go to seminars. Take real 6156 flight reviews. Get a workout. It should be no less than a practical test with the exception of it's not pass or fail. It's either satisfactory and you get endorsed or you, the instructor refrains from endorsing and you get a little more training, which you probably needed anyway. I still do it. We need to lower the accident rate. We need to lower the fatalities. I know glass cockpits and all that are wonderful, but they are terrible for getting everybody to what I call the Jefferson Syndrome. You're sitting there watching the Jeffersons instead of flying the airplane. We've all done it. Especially when the box is brand new, you go pick it up at the avionics shop and, man, you've got all these new toys to play with. That's what they make the computer tutorial for. Use it at home before you go play it. And certainly, Know how to do IFR with it before you put the airplane in the clouds. Get a safety pilot and fly all the instrument procedures before you go attempt to do them in the clouds. I know I was taking an aircraft to Iceland one time and I had to go to Greenland and it said right on the plate, do not fly IFR unless you have flown it previously VFR. So what I did is I got another inspector to take me to a simulator and we loaded that in approach in there so I could practice it. Preparation. Because I can tell you right now, if I hadn't, my risk had gone up a good 80%. We have to raise the awareness and our confidence. We need to be confident in, our, confident in our ability to be a safe pilot. Again, I wanted to put that up there one more time. That's unacceptable, folks. 766 people died in 1996. Again, that was my most recent statistics through the NTSB. 2007 numbers were still being crunched. That's too many deaths, especially when you go up there and find out that for U.S. air carrier, if you go to the top line, fatalities, I see zero, okay? I think there were two for scheduled carriers. That's just an amazing, it, it's a disparity that we need to change the culture of. And it's only you that can make a difference. Okay, I'm going to open this up for a few questions and then we'll we'll call it a wrap but I sure thank you for coming and I sure thank the audience that are watching on the internet streaming and I sure thank the audience on the satellite for letting us what I consider make a small difference okay any questions all right then yes S Steve I have one thing I can tell you I was riding in the cockpit with Alaska into Juneau and those pilots had a VFR chart with them all the way from Los Angeles to Juno. That's awesome because that gives them an option if, as Diego said, if all else takes a tank on you, it all tanks. You've got that. You have a peanut attitude indicator, good old basic needle ball airspeed, which is another item on the flight review that gets overlooked. Partial panel flying. Partial panel flying, good old fashioned needle ball airspeed, stick and rudder skills are just about gone because everybody looks at glass. If you are instructing in glass, every now and reach up there and turn the glass down to nothing. Dim the panel so that they can learn needle ball airspeed. Anything else? All right, if not, thank you so much. Steve, nicely done. Thanks, Walt.
And you're right, you can make a difference, but it's uh, through organization and developing that skill again. Uh, what was those principles you were talking about? Recency and exercise? Yeah, yeah all those buzzwords yeah. we use as instructors. That's right. Currency and, and proficiency have nothing in common. You can be current on paper and terrible in the cockpit. And if you have somebody signing you off that's your buddy, you're really cheating yourself. And people on the ground can pay the ultimate price, and the people in the airplane that don't know that you're not proficient pay the price. It needs to stop. What's the purpose of the POH? It's to move the CG toward the aft part, right? This guy literally, in that reenactment, put the flight bag with all that stuff up in the... How do you get to the baggage compartment when you're flying? It just doesn't happen. And even in the 135 world, I'll ask them, where's your GOM? Is it easy access? Where's the emergency procedures? So anyway, thanks a lot, and every one of us can make a difference. We can chisel down the big tree with a little chisel if we just take little chunks at a time. Thank you very much. You can come up if you want to. Yes. Stay right here. We're still on camera. Can you close your eyes? Get the roof. This time, not B. Roof. Okay. Computer. The computer let me down.